Hi folks, my name is David. I'm the minister here at Erskine Parish Church. It's great to have you connecting with us and I'm so glad you found our online resources. If you were to come into our physical church, you would get one of these welcome packs. So consider this your digital welcome. However you've joined us, we'd love it if you could like and subscribe to our platform. That allows you to continue to see when we're putting up new content. And also if you'd like to get in touch and actually connect with us, you can email at epcnotices at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Malachi has a very tricky job, one that throughout history not many of us have envied. And it's basically telling truth to power. Uh, Thomas More, in the time of the Reformation, spoke truth to power when he advised King Henry VIII that his life was not in keeping with that of a king serving before God. And he lost his life for it. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was thrown in Birmingham jail because he had the audacity uh, to call out for justice against the unjust structures in which he lived. And so we venerate and we look back and we really celebrate folks who have done that. But it's a position, if we're honest, a lot of us would struggle with because what's easier is to be part of the hive mentality, to go along with the crowd. And the crowd in Malchai is a very tough one. The context of the book is that the children of Israel, the uh, nation of Judah, have been exiled, as was prophesied and threatened, um, for their basically desecration of the worship that they were given. And they get exiled to Babylon, the temple gets destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and then about 70 years later, they get to return and to reestablish themselves in the land. But as they've reestablished themselves, things are a complete mess in terms of the civic and the religious life, which is usually being led by the same people. Things are not good. They're not living according to the ethics and the code that they've been given by God. It worship is a complete, um, it's sacrilege, really. It's a travesty. And also, there's rampant social injustice in the society. And these are all things that this community are being indicted for by God. And so it's into that context that Malachi has given this message as a prophetic voice from God to call people back to the right path and the right way, if you will. Um, Israel at the time, is, it starts to become Judah at this time in the way it will eventually be in the New Testament. It's basically a backwater or a colony of the Persian Empire. It'll go to the Greeks and the Romans when Jesus comes. But we're already on that road in Malachi. So we'll end up with that kind of tension of them aspiring to and wanting to be a great nation again. But famously in books like Malachi, looking up and blaming God for the reason that they're a backwater in someone else's empire rather than being a great nation themselves. And so what God does is through the prophet is takes them to the reason why things are not going well. So I want to look at it. Um, the outline should be on your sheets. We're going to think about the reason that God essentially says this is all so bad, you might as well pack up and go home in terms of worship, is because they've forgotten God's love. They've forgotten what true worship is supposed to look like, and they've forgotten the greatness of God's name. We first of all look at forgetting God's love. Now, God had established himself as a loving and a promise-keeping God when he originally called the people of Israel. He made that bond with Abraham, and he said he would continue to be that God for generations and generations. But the people also in that promise and that bond had obligations to be faithful to him. He opens this oracle or this, um, it's a bit like a, a legal speech presenting uh, the case, looking for any counter evidence and then coming to a conclusion is the way a lot of the prophet's oracles unfold. Verse two, he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, say the people, how have you loved us? And God goes back to their family lineage, their history and heritage and saying, wasn't Esau not Jacob's brother? And then he gives a, to summarize, saying, look, Esau and, and his land, Edom, they're, they're in disaster. And nothing is going well for them. And I gave you guys in this land every opportunity. And I know that Jacob, have I, have I loved Esau, have I hated? That's quoted in the New Testament, and it's a stumbling block for a lot of people. The best thing I can probably say to you is that that language is relative. And the focus is not so much on hatred as I wouldn't say as you and I understand it, but rather the 
You've got a thread and a story that goes all the way through the Bible that God chooses and he sets his love on people. And God, being who he is, is completely free to do that. And I would say to miss the point is to focus on the the not chosen and really rather to marvel on those of us that are chosen and have experienced God's love, because that's really what the story of Scripture is is interested in, in us having a sense of um, awe uh, that God has revealed and decided to set his love upon us. And so God is going back and saying, look, from the time of Jacob, I have set my love on you and your people. And uh, the word that he uses for love is rich with overtones of that bond and that covenant, those promises that God made that uh, in the ancient world were known uh, to be able to survive multiple generations. And they usually had emblems and markers. And he's saying, I've bonded myself and also in many ways staked my name on you as a people. I've loved you, I've been faithful to you, I've been there for you when you've walked away, uh, regardless of how faithless or uh, how much you have not believed in my love, it has still been there. I have loved you. And so, where does that leave them? Well, they are left without excuse, their disputation of But how have you loved us? God takes them to their history and to show them the consistency. And I think often that can be the same for us. It it can be normal when we're going through a bit of a difficult time or perhaps even crisis to say, well, where is God? That's something very common for people to say, both in and outside of the church, where is God or where has God been? And the focus on the circumstances is to miss the point because the idea of God's love being all encompassing and consistent is that it is there and it carries us despite the outward appearance of the circumstances of our lives. If you like, the circumstances of our lives are going to change anyway. If you think about people that know God and don't know God, everybody goes through this. They go through the ups and the downs. And so logically, that's not really any proof of God being there or not. The God causes his, both the rain and the sunshine to fall on the just and the unjust alike, to paraphrase one of the Psalms. And so that's actually a terrible guide. So to have the voice of the children of Israel saying, but how have you loved us? They obviously think they have a case to make by going, well, look at the nation we're in. It's, it's, a, it's a shadow of its form or glory. And God is trying to direct them towards a, a grander vision of who he is that, if you like, he doesn't exe- uh, exist to be, you know how in some cultures you can get little pocket idols and gods or, or good luck charms, or some people do that with crystals. And The idea is that you can control outcomes by doing certain rituals and that directs things in one way or the other. And consistently, the God, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, lifts people's visions way beyond that and says, sorry, I'm way beyond you being able to control things or you being able to measure me up by, well, how's our nation building been going for the last 10 years? He's saying, "My, my love actually encompasses generations and generations of your people. And I think the application for us is to know that God's love is firm and consistent and transcends our experiences and is even able to weather the times when we perhaps aren't feeling all that reciprocal in terms of our love or our connection to God back. But what can be helpful, a bit like the children of Israel are are brought back to their history, what can be helpful for us is to look back, particularly when we go through dry spells and we struggle with our connection to God or wondering very much whether whether he is there, is God always leaves a a trail of evidence, if you like, in, in our lives. If he is working in our lives, all of us will be able to look back at different points and go, I know he was at work there, or I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for God having done that or given me that encounter or helping me meet that person. And if you look for it, 
And if you, you kind of sit down and look with gratitude, you'll be able to see the pattern of him at work. And that can be one of the most encouraging things we can do is to look back and see where God has been at work because that helps us remember his great love going forward and in the future rather than forgetting it. And then they clearly had a massive problem. They hadn't only forgotten God's um, original covenant promises of love, but they'd forgotten some huge aspects of their worship. So let's see who's indicted. Well, we've got both the community of people and also the leaders and the priests. In verse 13, the prophet says, when you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them? from your hands, says the Lord. And then you've got an instance of people cheating God. And then you've got in verse 6, If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? It is your priests who show contempt for my name. And again, they dispute it and they say, well, how was that the case? By offering defiled food on my altar, by saying the Lord's table is contemptible. Okay, so there's a litany of laws in the Levitical code in the Old Testament that give specific instructions for what kind of animals and offerings one can bring. Now, that's a million miles away from us. None of us are bringing livestock in here today to show our appreciation for God, but there is a common denominator between then and now because the whole purpose of those Levitical laws was for people to be able to show a a sense of reverence and honor to God. And so the idea with uh, livestock was the currency. And so if it's diseased or lame, it's not worth very much. But if it's good and healthy and strong, it's worth a lot more. And so I, I would go as far as to argue that it wasn't actually about the animals, but it's a concrete way and expression of people's hearts where they're able to show the appreciation and gratitude in their hearts towards God and indeed their worship of him. And so that was the best way to do it then. Now it's a bit, bit different. We bring tithes and offerings and so on. But a lot of the same principles apply. The people are castigated because there is indication in the text that this is an ongoing thing. This isn't something happened that happened uh, happened once in Malachi's earshot or uh, was a one-off. This was the regular pattern, pattern and the practice. People basically bringing rubbish to God. Um, stuff that's completely unfit and, and, and that um, that, that shows a level of contempt for God. Uh, if you go into, try to get into the uh, armed forces, you can either be, uh, you go to a medical and you can either be passed or you can get some, a stamp called PMU, which is permanently medical unfit. It means that they have a standard, they need in some ways the best people to be able to defend the nation. And if you don't meet that, then they have to be able to label something and go, that doesn't belong here which is a, can be disappointment for a lot of people, but it happens. I remember when I was working in television and we would um, shoot lots and lots of material. You, I particularly would always shoot far too much. And then you make your life hard and you've got to sit down on a screen and watch through it all and try and edit and put together the best stuff that's going to tell your story on the screen. And what we used to have was, it was all digital, but we'd have the cutting room floor. We would have reams and reams, hours and hours of material that um, was either faulty, the picture was bad, or the sound was bad, or um, the person you were interviewing was not particularly interesting at that point, and nobody would want to sit and watch it. So you cut it, you throw it out, it ends up <laughs> on the floor. It's, it's rubbish. This would be the equivalent of putting all that rubbish out front and center. Now, you might agree that's what people do in television a lot when you sit down to watch it. But it's the heart and the intention of the person putting it out there and crafting it and giving it. That's the people's approach, just going, you know what? This doesn't matter. Shows of real dislocation and disconnection from the sense of worship that they were oriented and supposed to have. But then it's worse in a way because it's okay, one thing, the people, but if you're part of the hoi polloi, you can always say, well, I was led that way, and you know, we don't really have much of a good example. And they don't have a good example because the priests have shown contempt for God's name by offering defiled food on his altar. So the picture is people are bringing all this rubbish into the temple for the sacrifices, and the priests are going, ah, yeah, okay, put it on. That'll be fine. Basically... 
And they're supposed to be leading, you know, priests, there was not much of a separation between church and state at the time. So they are looked to as the civic leaders of their time. They are supposed to set the example for how that community is to be ordered and certainly meant to set the priorities of what is important with that community. And essentially, even by their questioning back, saying, well, how, what have we done? How have we done it? They've got absolutely no cognizance of the seriousness of what's going on. And so they are not taking either God or the worship of God very seriously. And in some sense, th there, is, there are few things that are more detrimental to a society than when the leadership are not taking the stuff they should be taking seriously. Seriously, Anybody in any position of authority. Um, one of the places I think I see this most acutely is I quite often have women who come and who will, when you ask them about their experience of going to the doctor or a GP, they can have much more difficulty than men um, because they'll quite often go and they'll say they're having this difficulty and that and they'll perhaps get told, well, have you tried going for a walk or something equally facile or outright not being believed that they're having the issues and it's, it's terrible. They're just, the thing isn't taken seriously and it can lead to further complications for their health, plus the sense of being invalidated. People are supposed to take things that affect other people seriously. And this, for a community who have been called by God's name and uniquely given access by this God to worship him as his people, and they're not even being given the resources to do that. It's an absolute tragedy. I was reading somewhere this week that there was a, a study done on the, the results of the, the Brexit, the removing ourselves from the European Union. And it looks like it's cost everybody in the country about two grand a year, not to mention the degradation to the economy that it's done. Now, it does, that doesn't mean that it couldn't have been done better or that it was fundamentally right or wrong. The point is, hardly anybody was given the information that they needed or that wasn't fronted up. And I certainly don't think the leaders that we had at the time took it terribly seriously. And that's an indictment. That's a travesty. That's actually a huge injustice because for a lot of people in our society now, two grand a year is a huge amount. Could be the difference between them making ends meet and not. That's outrageous. Leadership are supposed to set an example in how they take things seriously. But what about church? How does this translate into the New Testament church and age? There are so many ways to not to go through the motions, so at the end of the day, these guys are offering sacrifices and the altar is being lit up, but God is saying, you might as well close the doors and not light it up because this isn't worship. And there are lots of churches. Sometimes it's dead liturgy. It's people who are going through the motions wick by wick, but there's absolutely, it's a long time since anybody had a connection in their heart there um, because there's a pattern that they repeat and that's all that there is. It, it has become a pattern and it ceased to be alive. Or there are other churches that you can go into and people are almost bouncing off the walls in exuberance and um, everybody is jumping up and down and raising their hands in worship. And, and I'm just giving two contrasting visions of church. This isn't a comment on what is the right way to worship because in some sense it doesn't matter what they're doing. But if they're, they're, they're doing that, but that could be one of the most... A cliquey, difficult to break into churches after the worship's down and everyone's put their hands down to get some coffee, um, nobody will talk to you. Now, a lot of what they're being indicted for is, is the social aspect, not looking out for the neighbor, and that's, we'll get that to that later in Malachi, but that's being reflected in the rubbish worship and the actual literal rubbish that they're throwing out to worship. And so today, I think God would say, I don't care how eloquent your liturgy is, um, or how elaborate, or how old and traditional it is. I don't care how high you raise your hands in worship. I don't care how impressive your church uh, band is. I don't care how cool your church is seen as being. I don't care how much money your church seems to have in the bank, or how much uh, social capital or influence it seems to have. What I care about is that when people come and they go and they engage with worship, that something is alive within them. Being involved in church and worship should always have at the forefront of it that we're coming to meet with and engage with the living 
and the true God. That we actually believe that he's alive, that he's there, that he's real, and that he is there to receive that worship. And there's an intimacy and a connection there that we come to take part in. And if we're not expecting that or doing that, then according to God's word, we might as well not bother coming or turning up or carrying on what we're doing. Because I think this is what sets the church apart because everything else that we do, other people can do. We do a lot of social good and I love the social good that we do, but so do lots of charities and they can do that too. We provide community and so do lots of other spaces in Erskine and in Scotland and we do that well, but so do lots of other places. So we're just the same. The one thing that we do that is different is that we genuinely claim that people can come and experience an encounter the living and the true God. They can come and offer their worship to him and they can say, I worship the God and the maker and the creator of the universe there with other people who are doing the same thing. And then also, particularly in the reformed tradition, I can hear from him. I expect him to speak to me through his word. Isn't that amazing? But see, God can't be cheated because this group in Malchai and their temple worship They were coming and they were acting as if we're coming and we're doing it, but God might be there, might not be there, it doesn't matter. Let's just get on with the the rubbish sacrifice. There was, a few years ago, there was a famous incident of a a priest, pastor, in one of the big churches in Canada, might have been United Church in Canada, but she came out as an atheist and she was able to keep her job. Um, Because a lot of what goes on in, in churches can continue even if someone doesn't really believe it. But this is where the rubber meets the road because it should be, there should be a reality to it and a profoundness to it. And indeed, if we're coming to meet the living and the true God, that should create a sense of awe and reverence. And the way that's worked out is different from church to church. You know, I, I think I need to tread carefully because I think it's wrong to focus on the, the particulars, what we wear or don't wear. There's, People dress differently in all kinds of churches through the world, and that is because of culture and personal reasons, but in their heart, it's about honoring God. Do do you see? It's not actually about the form of the externals, it's it's what's in here, and that runs all the way through the Bible, you know? God says, uh, the people praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And the point is, is that our hearts have been warmed by God, then they come into the the presence of him in worship to burn that bit warmer and brighter because it's him who set that fire there. And what he is looking for is for that to come and and to be kindled afresh in the context of worship. That's what worship is for. And they've completely forgotten about worship. And lastly, and most briefly, they've forgotten about God's name. Verse 11, God says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. The intention of God since the Old Testament has been for his name to continue to go out and to be an object of hope and worship amongst all different kinds of peoples and people groups. And as we get to the end of the book, and I mean the whole book in Revelation, we see that picture completed in the new heavens and the new earth where there are people from all languages, nations, tribes, and tongues collectively worshiping God's name together. Now that was God's intention, but this is another aspect of of the problem with forgetting who they were worshiping or supposed to be worshiping. Because you see, worship was not just meant to be Uh, a self-indulgent thing. And the church is not meant to be an organization that just exists siloed off for either, maybe even not for its own benefit, but for its own amusement or um, for the propagation of just its own existence to just continue to live another day. If we do that, that's a really short-sighted vision of the church, that the people of God were there to exist so that more people might hear the name of the living and the true God and actually come to trust in that name and to put their own security in it and to find that they too can worship him. That was the whole point. There was a bit like um, the passage in in Matthew, the, the shining city on a hill. That's supposed to be the people of God in every age. 
And rather, these people, all the folks around them in the Persian Empire would have been seeing was them going, wow, you can bring any old rubbish to that God. I wonder if he really exists, because he seems to be uh, that pleased with just them bringing total dross. But what he's saying is, I'll pass it on. If you guys aren't going to worship me, there will be a day coming where people from other nations that don't even know me yet or know my name, they will know my name and they will find that so precious that they will bring the absolute best of what they have. Incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because essentially God is saying, look, I I have made everything. I'm worthy of that level of honor and worship and you can choose to do it or not do it. But um, remember when Jesus says that, when people are getting annoyed with him and his disciples and they tell them to shut up. And he says, if if we shut up, even the rocks will cry out in praise. Now, it's a figure of speech, but the point was that uh, God is so worthy of honor and worship that he will be worshiped one way or another. And this community was in being threatened with really missing out on the blessing and the privilege of being a beacon of the hope, the light, and the worship of God's name where they were. God's name is something uh, precious that he reveals to people because he doesn't, again, He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to choose anyone or reveal anything to anyone. But he has chosen to. And that's the story and the stream that we get to stand in. So may that be an encouragement to us that we'll all be able to remember God's love for us, even in difficulty, through difficulty, perhaps especially through difficulty, by looking back and seeing what he's done in our lives, that we'd be able to remember the worship of his name and that we take part in something that is unique but also potentially transformational and that we'd remember that we've been given the very name of God to be an emblem in the world in which we live so that other people might find it and put their trust in him. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen.